So welcome, folks. This is our latest episode of Golden Zoomies, and we have a really great lineup today. We're going to do a little watching of television, and we're going to see first Dr. Andy Flory, who is the chief medical officer and co-founder of PetDX, and Andy will talk first. Then we will see a video by Dr. Jerry Post, who is the chief medical officer at PhytoCure. Once Jerry's video is finished, we will pop on with the famous Dr. Rod Page, who I think everyone knows, but he is the professor and director of the Flint Animal Cancer Center at Colorado State University, and of course was principal investigator for the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study for many, many years. And Rod's going to join us and speak a little bit about a little bit about the history of cancer treatments and diagnosis in dogs, kind of where we've been, where we're going to be. And then when Rod's done, we will be taking some questions live so you can type your questions into the Q&A function. We will take a peek at them. I will probably try to combine them if I see a common theme arising. Without further ado, I will let Amy start the video. Hi there, my name is Andy Flory. I'm a veterinarian and a medical oncology specialist, and I'm also chief medical officer of PetDX. And I'm really excited to present to you today about our test called Oncocanine and how this test means that veterinarians can now detect cancer in dogs with just a blood draw. I wanna start with the origin of our company, which is one little dog, a very adorable little dog by the name of Poppy. She was my patient back in 2019. And unfortunately, Poppy's cancer that she was diagnosed with at the age of four, which is very young, was just found very late. And it meant that for her, there weren't a lot of options. Now, Poppy's owner had developed genomic testing for people and he wanted to help other dog owners find cancer in their pets earlier when there are more options and outcomes are likely to be better. And thus we started the company. And it was really because of this. Cancer is a huge problem in dogs. It is the number one cause of death in dogs over the age of one. And we see four to six million cancer diagnoses in the US in dogs every single year. In golden retrievers, it's also a huge problem, as you probably know. This study showed that in all dogs in the study, about 30% of them overall died due to cancer, but in golden retrievers specifically, it was about 40% of them. And then in an additional study here, looking at this survey, 60% of golden retrievers actually died of cancer. So this is a huge problem in, in golden retrievers. Now, apart from skin tumors, the three most common cancers that we see in golden retrievers are unfortunately really aggressive. Hemiangiosarcoma, lymphoma, and osteosarcoma. These are three really aggressive cancer types. And if we think about these cancer types and the way that we typically detect cancer in dogs, most of the time we're catching it really late. But if we could detect it earlier, there are a lot of benefits. For example, we know that dogs that are diagnosed earlier at an earlier stage, for example, have improved outcomes. They have a better prognosis if we find it at an earlier stage, meaning before it has spread. But we also know that there are benefits to finding cancer when it's early clinical detection, meaning before dogs are sick, while they're still feeling healthy and they're, they're asymptomatic. We know that there are benefits for a variety of cancer types with earlier clinical detection as well. In addition, when we find it earlier clinically, these patients can be easier to manage medically when we don't also have to manage their medical illness. It also can be less expensive to manage cancer if we're catching it before they are sick. And it also allows families uh, to really have time, time to understand what's going on. You have more options to choose from typically, and so you have time to kind of understand what those options are and make a plan rather than feel really forced into an urgent decision when your dog is feeling really ill. And so the exciting thing is that there is now a blood test for cancer. This is called liquid biopsy. And to understand how this works, we really need to start with understanding DNA. And so this is the name of the test, it's called Oncocanine. And it really starts with this knowledge that cancer is caused by alterations in the DNA. So we can think of these like abnormalities in the DNA or spelling mistakes. 
And these spelling mistakes can be really, really small. So they can be just down here at the little single DNA letter or nucleotide level. They can be changes that are really big. So spelling mistakes that are very, very long um, that affect long stretches of DNA. But when these mistakes or alterations accumulate, they confer an uncontrolled growth advantage to cells. And this is when cancer results. So this is how um, this liquid biopsy testing works using a technology called next generation sequencing or NGS. This really involves looking at these pieces of DNA that are being shed into the blood by cancer cells. DNA, when it gets into the bloodstream, it gets broken down, down into pieces or fragments. And these fragments that are circulating in the blood outside of any cell are called cell-free DNA. So here on the left, we have this blood vessel where normal cells and cancer cells are shedding little fragments of DNA into the blood. A special blood collection tube that stabilizes DNA is used to collect a blood sample. The sample is then shipped to the lab where the DNA is extracted and sequencing is performed. And then computer science called bioinformatics goes through and looks for these spelling mistakes. So it looks for these cancer associated alterations in the DNA that indicate the presence of cancer. So if we boil this down to a few concepts, it's that cancer is caused by these alterations in the DNA. There's a non-invasive test called liquid biopsy that can detect those alterations in the blood and that the detection of these alterations in the blood indicates the likely presence of cancer. So we developed this test called Oncocanine, and then we performed a very large clinical validation study called the Cancer Detection in Dogs or Candid Study. And this is published in a peer-reviewed journal called PLAS-1. This is a study that was looking at dogs with and without cancer to see how well does the test perform. So the Candid Study enrolled a lot of dogs. So if any of you out there are watching, enrolled your dogs into the study, thank you for your participation. We had so much enthusiasm for enrollment. Uh, so it was really, really inspiring to see. We had 1,100 dogs with and without cancer. They represented 85 different breeds. Over 40 different types of cancer were present in the cancer cohort. These were enrolled at 41 clin clinical sites on four continents. And a lot of veterinarians, including specialists, as well as PhDs and MDs, were included in this project. When we looked at the detection rates by different groups of cancers, in the most common cancers that we see in Goldens, the detection rate is 85% in lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma. And the most common cancers that we see in dogs in general, the detection rate was 62%. And then on the right side, what's really exciting is that the false positive rate is incredibly low. It's only 1.5%, which is really great. Now, if we look at the detection rates in those most common cancers that golden retrievers get, lymphoma, a 94%, hemangiosarcoma, 83%, and osteosarcoma, 72%. So these are really high detection numbers in those really aggressive common cancers that golden retrievers are diagnosed with, unfortunately. But the other thing to know is that this is really a multi-cancer detection test. It detected 30 different types of cancer in the candid study. So it's truly a multi-cancer test. So if we think about, okay, well, how would we use this in our golden retrievers? One of the main uses would be as a screening test when dogs are asymptomatic, but we know that golden retrievers are at higher risk because of their breed. So when should we start to recommend to screen goldens for cancer? Well, we know that a one age fits all approach is not likely to work because if you think about the diversity of breeds and sizes of dogs that we have in the world, um, and because there was limited evidence in the published literature, we performed a study looking at 3,400 dogs with cancer to identify the average age that cancer is diagnosed in dogs, which was around nine years old. Now, using some biological modeling, because we know we don't want to start screening at the age that most dogs get cancer, we want to start screening before that so that we have time to catch it, we recommend to start screening two years prior to that average age. So for all dogs, that means that we recommend starting at an age of seven. However, some dog breeds do get cancer younger. And so for those specific breeds, it's recommended to start as early as age four. Um, the ones that are at the top of that list are like boxers and giant breed dogs. And so some dogs should start screening as early as age four. But when we plug in the golden retriever to the model, we found that the average age at cancer diagnosis was eight in golden retrievers. So we recommend to start annual screening at the age of six, specifically for golden retrievers. 
Now we put all of his data into an online calculator or tool. This is called the Cancer Safe Tool, stands for Screening Age for Early Detection. You can take a picture of that QR code. It will take you right to the tool. You can enter your dog's age, breed, and weight, and it will return to you when should you uh, start screening for your particular pet. So in addition to using this as a screening test, on the left side of the screen here, we recommend to use this as an annual screening test. So once a year, starting for golden retrievers at the age of six. On the right side, the other use of this is as an aid in diagnosis test in patients for which cancer is suspected. So there are some um, unique scenarios where veterinarians might recommend to use this as an aid in diagnosis test. For example, if you're noticing clinical signs of cancer at home, like those that are listed on the screen here, if you're noticing these, you definitely wanna take your dog into your veterinarian, have them checked out, see what might be going on. This could be an indication for the oncocanine test. Also, if your veterinarian finds things on the physical exam that makes them suspicious of cancer, like big lymph nodes or swelling in the abdomen or a mass in the belly or limping or weight loss, these can be signs or physical exam findings consistent with cancer. And so they might recommend this test. Or if they see something on imaging like x-rays or ultrasound, like a mass in the an internal organ um, or in the bone, uh, an abnormal lesion or enlarged lymph nodes inside of the body, that could be suspicious for cancer. Or they suspect cancer, but they've tried to do a workup and so far it's been inconclusive. These could be indications for using oncocanine as an aid in diagnosis. Now, in terms of how to get this test for your dog, the first step is to ask your veterinarian if this is a good test for your dog. Um, your veterinarian may not be aware of the test yet, and they may not have kits yet, but they do need a kit to run the test. If so, they need to get a kit. They can get those directly from us, PetDX, or from one of our diagnostic partners, Antec or IDEX. Um, these are available really at every veterinary clinic, so your veterinarian should have access through one of those. There's no special preparation for your dog. Your dog doesn't need to be fasted for the test. And so your veterinarian will draw a blood sample, send it to our lab in San Diego, and results will come back to your veterinarian in one to two weeks. And then your veterinarian will discuss the results with you along with any recommended next steps. Now, in terms of what those results look like, the result is really a yes, no. It's a cancer signal is detected or cancer signal is not detected. Cancer signal is detected, meaning we found those DNA alterations consistent with the presence of cancer because those DNA alterations, they don't exist in healthy individuals. They don't exist in conditions like inflammation or infection. So if we see that cancer signal, we're really concerned that this increases the likelihood that cancer is present in your pet. But it is important to note that this is not a diagnostic test. It's a screening test. So just like if we as humans were to go for a cancer screening test, like a mammogram or a colonoscopy, things like this, a positive test would be followed up with additional diagnostics to find out what's going on and confirm the diagnosis. And we never make important decisions um, with the basis of this test alone. We always make those kind of at, as a, uh, in addition to other test results. Now, if we do get that positive test result back, in terms of what we're gonna do as a next step is we're gonna see where could this cancer signal be coming from? If your veterinarian did it because they suspected cancer, they probably know what diagnostic test to recommend next. But if they did it as a screening test, we kind of want to do a combination of tests that looks in the most common places that cancer could be hiding by doing things like a physical exam and routine blood and urine tests, routine imaging tests like x-rays and ultrasound, sampling of any abnormalities that we find. And we have a program that can support the financial, um, provide some financial assistance to do this workup if your dog does get a positive result. Now, in addition to that, a cancer signal not detected result, um, if you get this type of result, this decreases the likelihood that cancer is present, but it doesn't rule it out. And it's important to note that, again, this is a screening test, not a diagnostic test. And so um, if we've run this test as an aid in diagnosis and we get a negative, cancer still could be present. So we want to continue to do that diagnostic testing. But if we've done this as a screening test, 94% of dogs were not diagnosed with cancer in the follow-up period over the next about six months. So it's important to note that this is a point in time sort of test that tells you is cancer signal present today, but it doesn't mean that cancer won't develop in the future. That's why it's important to continue serial testing, to continue to be vigilant and look for signs of cancer in your dog. So as a summary, cancer is caused by alterations or abnormalities in the DNA. 
Oncocanine can detect these alterations in the blood, in the DNA fragments in the blood. And if we do detect these abnormalities in the blood, it indicates the likely presence of cancer. So if they're detected, your veterinarian will talk to you about next steps, but we have a clinical support team that can provide information to your veterinarian as well as offer enrollment into a financial assistance program that we have to potentially help with some of that workup. It can detect many types of cancer that are common in golden retrievers, including lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma. And for golden retrievers specifically, the recommended age to start cancer screening is at the age of six. The first step is certainly to talk to your vet veterinarian if oncocanine is right for your dog. So thank you so much for your attention. Please check out the pet parents page of our website for more information. Um, if your veterinarian has not heard of Oncocanine yet, please take a picture of that QR code or head to our website and fill out the interest form. A member of our team can reach out to your veterinarian directly and educate them on and provide them um, the materials that they need to start um, performing the test or to offer this test for your dog. So with that, a huge thank you from me and I look forward to taking any questions. That was great. I hope everybody really enjoyed that. I learned a lot from Dr. Flory. While we're waiting to tee up our next video, I wanted to do a little bit of um, housekeeping. Remember to put your questions if they're kind of content related to in the Q&A and I'll be watching those. The team has asked that if we have anything, we have someone who had some trouble with sound that you put that in the chat and we'll divide them up and hopefully conquer with those. Anyway, without, um, too much more delay. We'll go ahead and see the next video, which has been going to be uh, Dr. Jerry Post again from Phytocure. And just as a reminder, you guys, we will be taking questions at the end of Dr. Rod Page's portion, which will be, we'll do Dr. Post's video, then we'll have Rod come on live, and then we'll be answering questions live. I want to thank Morris Animal Foundation for inviting me to give this presentation and talk to the incredibly dedicated pet parents of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. You are all amazing. In the next 15 minutes, I hope to cover these four items. Who I am, why we are all here today, what is Phytocure, and how can it help dogs with cancer? So my name is Jerry Post, and I'm currently the Chief Medical Officer at Phytocure. I've been a board certified veterinary oncologist in clinical practice for over 30 years. I'm the founder of Animal Cancer Foundation, the Veterinary Cancer Center in Norwalk, and I've participated in over 20 clinical trials and have published over 40 peer reviewed papers. I'm an adjunct professor in comparative medicine at Yale University. The reason why we're all here today is because cancer is a problem, a big problem for dogs in general and for golden retrievers in particular. Unfortunately, this disease is quite common and based on the preliminary data from the golden retriever lifetime study, the most common cancer in goldens is a particularly aggressive cancer, hemangiosarcoma. As if this wasn't enough, our ability to diagnose and treat this and other types of cancers has not appreciably improved over the past 30 years. Don't get me wrong. We as veterinarians are far better at taking care of dogs with cancer, of dramatically improving their quality of life, but we aren't any closer to curing this dreaded disease. But there is hope. The advent of precision medicine, including genomics and targeted therapy, has transformed the diagnosis and treatment of many cancers for people. The power of precision medicine is now available for dogs. Cancer is a genetic disease at its core. Genes are the instructions that tell ourselves how to function properly. When these genes become damaged or mutated, they can cause cells to grow and divide uncontrollably, leading to the development of cancer. The genomic characterization of cancer involves studying the genetic changes that occur in these cancer cells. And this can include analyzing the DNA sequence of the cancer cells to identify mutations. By understanding the genomic characteristics of a particular cancer, 
Doctors and veterinarians can develop personalized treatment plans that target the specific genetic abnormalities driving that cancer's growth. This approach is known as precision medicine and really has the power to revolutionize cancer treatment. Vitocure is taking the advancements that have proven to be effective in the treatment of cancers in people and using it for dogs. Why do we know this approach will work? Well, cancers are similar between dogs and people, and dogs are already being used in human cancer drug testing. So what is precision medicine? Precision medicine is an approach to healthcare that takes into account individual differences in genes, environment, and lifestyle. By analyzing a cancer's unique characteristics, doctors and veterinarians can tailor treatments to be more effective and also minimize potential side effects. This is different from, from a traditional one-size-fits-all medicine, which may not work as well for everyone. So Phytocure is a precision medicine platform for dogs with cancer. Phytocure is the first to bring this cutting edge approach commonly deployed in human cancer care to canine cancer. The Phytocure DNA analysis genomically characterizes tumors, leverages our deep database and pinpoints targeted therapies using drugs that are FDA approved for humans with dosages that are adjusted and compounded for canine patients by our pharmacy partner, the largest compounding pharmacy in the US. These targeted therapies are given orally at home by you, the pet parents. Genomic sequencing can also provide prognostic information as well as help select between potential traditional chemotherapy drugs. When a person is diagnosed with cancer today, this is the approach that their oncologist takes. It is now standard of care in many cancers that humans and dogs share. We are unlocking that same opportunity for dogs and we're also collecting data in the process to inform future cancer cases. We know that cancer care for dogs can be vastly improved. There are over 200 targeted therapies available for people who get cancer at the rate of 1.8 million per year, while there is only one targeted therapy approved for dogs who get cancer at the rate of 6 million per year. We also know that traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy used in dogs is toxic, kills both healthy and cancerous cells. It's expensive. It's 30 years behind human cancer care. And there is limited access to the veterinary oncologist with the specialized equipment needed to administer this type of therapy. The sad reality is that there are too many dogs with cancer and not enough access to care. The 500 oncologists in the US simply cannot serve the growing demand. Phytocure wants all dogs with cancer to get the care that they deserve and that pet parents want. As all of the therapies recommended by Phytocure are oral, these medications can be given at home. This means less visits to the veterinary office. And again, because these therapies are oral, no specialized equipment is needed as it is for the traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy. This means that dogs can be treated at many more veterinary hospitals. Targeted therapy is a type of cancer treatment that aims to specifically target cancer cells while minimizing harm to healthy cells. Unlike traditional chemotherapy, which can affect both cancer cells and healthy cells, targeted therapy uses drugs or other substances that are designed to block the growth and spread of cancer cells by targeting specific molecules or proteins that are found predominantly in cancer cells. Targeted therapy is often used in conjunction with other cancer treatments, such as surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. And it may be used to treat many different types of cancer. It's important to note that targeted therapy is not a one size fits all approach and that the treatment that's right for one dog may not be right for another. Overall, targeted therapy is an important part of modern cancer treatment and is helping to improve outcomes and quality of life for many cancer patients already. Let me walk you through the phytocure process. Your veterinarian is the person who enrolls the case. 
But there are FidoCure employees who are available to answer the questions that you as pet parents might have. Your veterinarian can use any pathology lab as we work with all of them. Once you get the unfortunate diagnosis of cancer, the process starts. Your veterinarian enrolls your pet through an online portal that is simple and easy to use. Once your pet is enrolled, PhytoCure works with the pathology lab to get the biopsy sample so that we can start the genetic testing. Once the genetic testing is complete, a process that takes approximately seven to 10 days, a comprehensive report is generated that lists all of the targetable mutations found in your dog's cancer. It lists the potential therapies indicated by these mutations and any prognostic information based upon the genetic results. PhytoCure then calls your veterinarian to go over these results. If you as the pet parent and your veterinarian decide to use targeted therapies, an order is placed through the PhytoCure portal, again, making it as easy as possible for your veterinarian. We discuss and send to your veterinarian the suggested dosage, the recommended handling instructions for you, the pet parent, drug sheets with all of the safety data, and a recommended monitoring schedule based upon the drug that is ordered. This makes it easier for you and your veterinarian to discuss these targeted therapies. Again, all of these targeted therapies are oral medications. We also make ourselves available 24 seven to your veterinarian in case they have any questions about your dog and how he or she is handling these medications. We always wanna make sure that your veterinarian feels supported when using our services. Another aspect that makes PhytoCure different is that our team will reach out to your veterinarian and ask for medical records about each case. This is how we continuously keep our research current and ultimately help more dogs. PhytoCure was built from the ground up to do this, to collect outcomes and advance canine cancer care knowledge for the sake of all dogs. PhytoCure is widely used. There are over 900 clinics across the United States that use our services, and we have enrolled over 4,000 dogs into PhytoCure and helped over 20,000 pet parents who have called PhytoCure looking for help. Because we are not part of a traditional clinical trial, we are collecting data on all of the dogs enrolled in PhytoCure, something called real-world data and real-world evidence. The differences between real world data that we collect and traditional clinical trial data is displayed here. Basically, real world data is collected under real life circumstances and can give us a measure of how well a therapy is doing in the general population. There are still advantages to randomized controlled trials in that they are strictly controlled. The best way to get the most robust information about cancer is to use both sources of data. So now that you know what PhytoCure is, a precision medicine platform that uses genomics and oral targeted therapies, how can this help dogs with cancer? Here are some of our preliminary work looking at dogs with hemangiosarcoma as an example. Here we show that surgery and targeted therapy, plus or minus doxorubicin, allows dogs to live longer than surgery and doxorubicin alone. Additionally, 25% of the dogs enrolled in PhytoCure live for over one year, whereas historically, only approximately 10% of dogs with hemangiosarcoma live for over a year when treated with doxorubicin alone. In this slide, we show that hemangiosarcoma is not just one disease. There are at least four subtypes based upon the genetic characteristics of the tumor. Now that we know this, we can start to tease out if there are any differences between these four groups of hemangiosarcomas in terms of prognosis or response to treatment. Preliminary work at PhytoCure indicates that dogs with hemangiosarcoma that have a mutation in the NRAS gene might do better than dogs with hemangiosarcomas that have other mutations. This is the type of work we are doing for most canine cancers. One additional thing that's critical that PhytoCure does is use the newest technologies to help dogs. In healthcare, the use of artificial intelligence or AI is revolutionizing human health. 
AI is a powerful tool that can be used to improve human healthcare in many ways. AI can be used to analyze large amounts of patient data, such as medical records, lab results, and imaging scans, to identify patterns and insights that may not be visible to the human eye. AI can also be used to develop predictive models to help doctors and veterinarians and researchers better understand how different factors, such as genetics, lifestyle, and environmental factors, contribute to health and disease. These models can help doctors and veterinarians predict a patient's risk of developing certain conditions and also help design personalized treatment plans. Phytocure is using this powerful technique to help dogs with cancer. Dr. James Zhu, who is a world-renowned leader in healthcare AI, is leading Phytocure's AI team. We have lofty goals at Phytocure when it comes to AI. We plan to integrate genomics, the electronic medical records, and all of the real world data we collect into a common platform. We can then analyze this data and make recommendations about therapy based upon all of this data to help more dogs with cancer. We are the first company to employ AI to do this, and we are using the best, most experienced AI team in the world. Thank you again to Mars Animal Foundation for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today and for sponsoring the Golden Retrieve for Lifetime study, a truly groundbreaking achievement. Thank you to you, the pet parents, for your dedication, commitment, and courage. Without you, there would be no study. And lastly, thank you to all of the Golden Retrievers and to all of the pets who so enrich our lives every day. Wow, that was great. I hope you guys enjoyed that presentation. I'm going to ask Rod, oh, here he comes, up, up front and on stage, coming live to us from his fantastic office there at Colorado State University. So Rod, I wanted to ask you, what have you seen in your time as an oncologist, like where we're going, like things maybe you never even dreamed of when you first passed boards? Um, not that long ago. I don't want to like say years and years, but. <laughs> well, thank, thanks, Kelly. And thanks to um, the Morris Animal Foundation team for uh, hosting the uh, webinar here. Uh, and it is, it has been a long time. You know, I, um, I'm not sure that um, Jerry will remember, but uh, at the time that we were both at the Animal Medical Center and perhaps um, I predate him. I know I predate him, but we didn't even have ultrasound evaluations at the abdomen at that time. So everything was. Uh, used uh, that we had available. But over the course of the 42 years that I've been involved with uh, trying to manage and, and to help dogs and cats with cancer, there have been tremendous advantages over um, the way it used to be in terms of imaging, in terms of um, cytologic and histopathologic diagnoses, in terms of care, in terms of almost everything we can think of. Uh, but what we were really lacking is uh, this basis in uh, cancer biology that both uh, Dr. Flory and Dr. Post have mentioned and are uh, rapidly advancing in the, um, in the space here. Um, and so let me just kind of set uh, a context for you in terms of how this transformed specific types of uh, cancer success treatment, successful treatment in, in people. First of all, you know, the um, genetic characterization of lung cancer has dramatically improved uh, the outcomes for people with lung cancer based on a variety of genetic um, mutations that cluster into either favorable or unfavorable uh, cohorts. Uh, in addition, there are um, new changes in acute myelogenous leukemia that indicates specific success or failure. And I think that is the, um, is the thing we're lacking. We're really probably at least 10 years behind uh, the human field in terms of characterizing our um, cancers in our companion animals. But in many ways, that may actually serve us um, uh, well, because we don't have to necessarily repeat the same mistakes. We can learn from what is, has been done. Uh, we can learn how to be more rigorous, how to provide better evidence of correlations, but causal correlations between the genetic alterations and outcomes. And I think that will emerge over time in a much more uh, rapid way, perhaps, than it did in people even. So 
you know, I'm very hopeful for the future. I think that um, there will be uh, continued detail of not only the um, genetic basis for disease, but I think there will be a um, plethora of information that is being developed and, and analyzed now for all of the other characteristics that um, relate to cancer development, in particular, how the immune system is co-opted by cancer to be suppressive and to, um, and to allow cancers to be able to uh, arise in the first place and how we might combat those. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be uh, a tremendous um, increase in our understanding and our basic understanding of, of biology and how that translates into therapeutics uh, will be uh, yet to be determined. But I, you know, I wanted to also focus a little bit on the original reasons why we did uh, establish the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. And that specifically was to look for risk factors, not to look for therapeutic outcomes. In fact, we don't recommend any therapeutic outcome for uh, dogs that happen to get uh, uh, any particular disease that is left up to the decision between the veterinarian and the owner. But what we were hoping to do, and I think we have been uh, successful in acquiring a huge amount of data that can look at uh, environmental and genetic uh, dietary and uh, lifestyle risk factors that can be correlated with a specific type of cancer and perhaps used in the future to be able to uh, understand how to uh, alter the, the future of that dog that has uh, a high uh, risk factor for a particular disease. So <clears throat> what we have now, um, 10 years after the, um, the final enrollment of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study um, is a cohort now that is a, a, has an age, an average age of about 10 and a half or 11. I think they've been, we're approaching the primary uh, aggregate endpoint that we proposed, which would be 500 specific unique in, um, diagnoses for the four major cancer types that have been previously um, identified by Dr. Flory in golden retrievers that uh, constitute at least 80% of the morbidity and mortality for cancer. So I think the, uh, the, the value now is that uh, we have this um, enormous database we have a maturing uh, understanding of what the timeline for development of each of these cancers is, has been for uh, the, this population. It's a captive population, which means we can finally understand what the true incidence of some of these cancers are. That never was possible before. So we have a denominator. And now we have uh, an, uh, pretty clear evidence of, of the numerators as well. So unfortunately, as has been mentioned, um, well over half of the dogs have died of cancer at this point, and the majority of those have been um, due to hemangiosarcoma. So uh, where we go from here is going to be um, some, somebody else's job <laughs> going into the future. And it could, be, it could be many years before we actually find some of these answers that are going to dramatically impact uh, the incidence of hemangiosarcoma. But, there's some really interesting and really intriguing questions. You know, uh, there's still this question about um, the nature of uh, the difference in incidence of hemangiosarcoma in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, there are some questions left to be discovered about the impact of reproductive hormone exposures over the course of the lifetime of a dog that um, may impact cancer development and uh, other major conditions and, and diseases. So. You know, we're, we're finishing up um, a really significant effort uh, in the healthcare for golden retrievers and for animals, for dogs. But the, the real story will require years of interrogation of this huge database that we built. So I have a question for you, Rod, that comes up quite a bit, and it would be great to have you weigh in on it, which is, you know, we talked about the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study and why we chose Goldens, but what I get asked quite a bit, and you probably do too, which is what is, how, um, how is this data going to maybe help other dog breeds, right? Sometimes I get people who say, well, is this just going to be applicable to Goldens or is it going to have a broader applicability? Same uh -huh. thing, can we make a jump to other species and and also which includes people? And how do you answer that or, or how do you approach that? 
Well, when we when we first thought about um, how to build this um, this study, it was clear that we were um, we had to rely on uh, the best uh, accumulation of data that we could get, and that meant we needed to have a population of dogs that had a high incidence of cancer were owned by uh, people who love them and would commit to the lifetime of care, which meant that there would need to be a financial in, uh, commitment to the care, um, and that you know they were uh, going to be able to answer and continue to uh, provide in information uh, through a uh, web-based uh, survey instrument, and the veterinarians were going to have to commit as well. So we knew that it would be a relatively high um, uh, financially secure group of owners that would be asked to provide this information. But I think, you know, we, we were able to overcome any questions about uh, representation to other uh, groups of dogs or even other groups of uh, golden retrievers by knowing that without such, uh, such uh, restrictions or such uh, needs, we wouldn't be able to complete the study at all. And I think the, um, the, uh, compliance rate that we have now, uh, 10 years afterwards, we're at 85 compliance, 10 years into the study. Uh, that is remarkable. And that is a major win for any human study. They would be more than happy to have a compliance uh, rate of 85% after this length of time. So um, I think it, it does open that question. Is it going to provide data for um, other, other breeds? And there are some questions that I'm, I'm sure will be very, very useful. Uh, if we find that there's a particular indication to, to begin screening for um, a particular tumor type, that would be easy to translate into another, into another breed study. Uh, we also collect all the information on everything besides cancer. So as uh, you know, we, we collected a lot of information on dogs that uh, developed epilepsy, and uh, that's an early age disorder. So that information has probably a lot of relevance to other breeds that may have a higher risk of epilepsy. And it goes on and on. You know, the, the list of things that this study can contribute is really endless. Yeah, I think um, the, that's a good point. Uh, for all of the people who are listening of golden retrievers, I know we worry about cancer, but I think some of our most common diagnoses are really common amongst across breeds. Like uh, I, I know there are golden owners and got allergies and oh, yeah. problems and those sure. are way up there. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be, that'd be interesting. So the last thing I'm going to ask you before I let you go is if you were thinking back to yourself um, starting out as an oncologist and, and looking now, what is surprises you like, what would, did you never anticipate we would be talking about now versus 40 years ago? Hmm. Well, I guess the um, the thing that surprises me the most is how um, how necessary this specialty uh, appears to have become for pet owners. Um, I think with the evolution of specialty training programs across the uh, across the spectrum, not just medical oncology but radiation oncology, surgical oncology, the uh, number of um, pet owners that are being uh, serve, served served through the uh, skills of these uh, individuals really, really surprises me. It was really impossible to even fill our residency training programs at the beginning uh, before we were even a uh, ACVIM registered specialty. And now we, uh, at least here at CSU, we have 60 or 80 applicants for one application or for one position. So I think, you know, that's the growth of the specialty that correlates with, um, you know, the growth of, of, of individuals that are, um, really, really committed to their pets uh, makes me makes me very happy. Well, that's that's good. Yeah, I can. Uh, I hate to say it, but the gray hair shows that I have been around a long time too. And I can remember when we had our internal medicine, the ACBAM, with all of its subspecialties. And right there were maybe five hundred people in the room, and now there are several thousand. But we're still we're still not that many when you think about. Uh, yeah veterinarians uh, across the board. So I'm going to ask if Andy and Jerry are here. I'm sorry. I know Jerry's here. If you guys could come on stage. Hello, Andy. Hi. Hello, Jerry again. I have some questions that I'm going to, I'm trying to, you guys have submitted some great questions and I'm trying to kind of 
combine them a little bit. What one that seems to be cropping up, and I'm going to give it to both Andy and Jerry, is a couple of people are asking, like, how is is your stuff different? I guess like some people are like, I have used uh, Dr. Flory's service, and I've used Phytocure. So, like, what's different? Uh, if you guys could go over that, that would be really great. I think. Uh, Jerry, do you want me to start? Sure. Okay. Um, so our test on cocaine is a blood test. So this is something that is typically going to be used either as a screening when your dog looks healthy, they're asymptomatic, um, but your dog, if you have a golden retriever and that's why you're watching this, your dog is unfortunately at higher risk of cancer. And so starting that testing would be recommended when your dog is at increased risk. And as we showed in our study, for golden retrievers, that age that really makes sense to start doing that is around age six. And then it also can be used to detect whether cancer is present in the body right now, either in situations where your veterinarian suspects cancer. And additionally, if your dog has had cancer in the past and your veterinarian wants to monitor for cancer coming back or still being present after surgery. So that's sort of how this technology works is it's looking for presence of cancer by looking at the DNA in the blood um, at the time that the blood is collected. Thanks, Cindy. So Phytocure is different in that um, we our test is used when there is a diagnosis of cancer, um, similar to you know people when you get a diagnosis of cancer. And then we use the tissue to look for specific genetic mutations and characterize those specific genetic mutations. So whereas Dr. Flory's test is a screening test, our test is done when there is a diagnosis of cancer and tells you which genes are mutated in that in particular cancer. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, Andy, someone asked kind of early on, and I think you've mentioned this a little bit, but could you talk again about, uh, someone asked, if my vet does not provide this test, how I can how can I find someone in my area that does? Yeah, for sure. So if your vet does not carry it, I think the easiest thing, honestly, is just to see if your vet or Narian could um, offer the test for you. And there are some easy ways that that could happen. Um, you could talk to your veterinarian and um, mention the test to them, talk about it with them. You could go to our website and enter into the interest form your veterinarian's uh, clinic and name, and we can reach out and educate them and provide um, access to kits. Um, if those options don't work and you do want to find other clinics in your area that are offering it, we do have a clinic locator on the website as well. So you can check that out on the pet parents page at petdx.com. Okay. Um, let me look, I'm looking over here. I'm trying to combine um, some because, uh, and Andy, this is going to put both you and Jerry a little bit on the spot. I have a bunch of people going, I had a dog, they died of cancer. Uh, now, like when, I think you answered this a little bit, like when should I, should I start? And also frequency. I have someone who wrote, and this is horrifying that they lost two dogs in five weeks time androsarcoma. So I think can you guys speak to maybe the frequency or does anyone even know that yet? Sure. Yeah, I can, um, I can answer that. So the one thing to keep in mind is that this blood test, it's not a risk prediction test, right? So it's not like when we, as people, you know, you hear about these cancer predisposition genes like BRCA1 and 2, um, that sort of thing. It's it's not looking for whether your dog is predisposed or at high risk of cancer. It's actually looking for presence of cancer DNA in your dog right now. So you really want to, when you think about using a test like that, you want to use it once your dog is at higher risk. So, um, you know, I, I've had people ask me, I have a golden retriever. Should I just start testing at the age of one? And no, I mean, it would be great if there were tests that could tell us, you know, that early, but really because it's looking for presence of cancer in the body right now, you want to start looking when we know that your dog is at higher risk. And so based on the study, the recommended age for golden retrievers is to start testing at the age of six. Now, in terms of frequency, this is a great question. We recommended annual to start. And I think that across the board, that's probably a good recommendation. 
But I do think that there are probably breeds and probably cancer types that we that we would benefit from having more frequent testing. We're currently doing a lifetime study in dogs to sort of understand what is the best frequency in different cancers, different breeds and that sort of thing. It might be that it's actually, you know, better to do it every six months, for example, for some breeds. So I would say, you know, talk to your veterinarian about what might be right for your dog, but and the recommendation is annual, but certainly more frequent could potentially catch really rapidly growing cancers a little bit faster. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Andy. I, you know, um, number one, I, I don't think that that test unfortunately exists right now in terms of, you know, um, how can we um, catch cancer incredibly early or predict which dogs are going to get cancer more likely. But I would say that because of the golden retriever lifetime study and the data that that study has collected, we actually can start to um, build studies that can answer that question. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, um, before the, you know, golden retriever lifetime study was initiated, I don't even think we could postulate. Um, but I think because of, you know, the work of Morris Animal Foundation and all of the people who are on this webinar, we can actually start to tease out that data um, that's already been collected and try and, and focus on an answer. So um, a bunch of people, and I don't want to put either Andy or Jerry on the spot, but they're asking about costs. And that could factor into, right, like how often I might look at this. Can, can you guys speak to that a little bit? For sure. Um, so the cost of the oncocanine blood test, most veterinarians are selling it um, right around the four to five hundred dollar mark. So it really depends on your veterinarian, though. And so I would say contact them to find out what the cost is. Um, and but that's what we're seeing. The averages are is in the four to five hundred dollar range. Yeah. And for our test, um, again, um, the veterinarians will typically sell it for what. Um, is up to them in terms of markup, but typically it's around a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for the genomic screening. Okay, a couple of people. I'm going to give this to Rod because this is an age-old question, and Andy and Jerry probably, as practicing oncologists, got this as well. Which is why don't for hemangiosarcoma, why don't we just take the spleen out, right, prophylactically? Oh. And um, <laughs> and and I heard it in practice as well. Uh, Rod, do you want to answer that? That's been a question that's been around for a long, long time. Um, and um, I know that there are uh, there are veterinarians that will do it. I don't think that there's any evidence that it would make any difference. The, uh, the origin of this particular tumor type is um, such that we might just shift it from the, the spleen to the, uh, to the liver or to the heart or another blood vessel. So it's hard to know, um, and uh, there are certainly dogs within the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study that have probably had prophylactic splenectomies, and if there's enough of them, we could go back and determine if there was a change in incidence. So I think that's the value of this uh, large cohort. Um, owners would be able to make that choice. Perhaps the veterinarian would recommend that, um, and, and if we can identify uh, a difference, then it would certainly justify a, a full-blown study. But right now, I don't think there's any evidence that that would make a difference. Yeah, I, I would agree, Rod. You know, if you look at, you know, the origin of the hemangiosarcoma cell, you know, there's, you know, pretty convincing evidence that it comes from not the spleen, but the bone marrow. So just removing the spleen, you may just remove the first organ that that cancerous cell starts to grow and live in but you're not gonna be removing the source of the cancer, unfortunately. Um, another question, and I think all of you could address this because I think, I think this is um, something people have probably asked you, which is, I'm gonna rephrase it, but you know, can a dog that has hemangiosarcoma pass it along to their offspring? And I think that speaks to the genetic background. Do you guys want to speak to what we know and what we don't know about that? Sure. Um, do you want me to start, Andy? Sure. So I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, most cancers are not just 
related to a single gene, you know, like the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 genes. It's more like every body, every ma mammal is born with a certain baseline risk of cancer based upon their genes. Um, and so it's lots of genes interacting that give a dog a particular cancer risk. And there are certain factors like diet, environment, things like that, that can either raise or lower that baseline risk. Um, so number one, I don't think we know enough about the um, genomics of cancer like hemangiosarcoma to tell what every gene that's responsible for that particular cancer, but it's likely going to be multiple genes. Um, so I guess the answer that I would give is we just don't know enough to make uh, that call just yet. I, I would I would go a little bit further and say it's probably not heritable. I don't think we have any in evidence that this is um, passed along in such a frequency or through such Mendelian inheritance patterns that we could say that this particular uh, sire or this particular uh, dam what, has a high risk of uh, producing puppies with a, a high risk of hemangiosarcoma. There are certain uh, breeds and certain examples of that, and I don't think that exists with hemangiosarcoma in Goldens. That's a that's a bold statement, <laughs> but it's true. And I have heard, and I don't mean to be sarcastic or disrespectful to people who are listening, but I think um, trying to root it out like it's going to be a simple genetic test right? And we're just going to root it out, right? We're going to root it out of Goldens or pick, pick a cancer and a breed or even a disease and a breed. And I think what we're learning is it's so much more complicated than that, that it is, um, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So maybe looking, at, you know, trying to answer other questions, because somebody asked that about breeders and screening. I mean, what do you guys think about that? Breed screening or asking uh, breeders to screen for say um, um, a RAS mutation Thank you, Jerry. right right that that kind of thing um, as a yeah. you know when they're uh, you know we screen for eye problems is there I, anything that that's going to happen I think that's a different that's a different question that requires um, a little bit more uh, rigor in terms of assigning uh, causality to a particular uh, a particular genetic profile and right now veterinary medicine doesn't have the same type of um, requirements for a uh, association, a formal association that happens in people. Uh, on, on, they don't have any certification that that particular mutation causes a disease yet. Um, so I think you know if we were to start doing large scale screening of breeders, it would be um, necessary to have some way of um, ensuring that the outcomes that we're looking for are actually um, able to be measured. You know, we can't follow every dog uh, for, the, for that entire life. Um, in order to prove that, there'd have to be some other surrogate endpoint to measure. So it, it's, um, it's not out of the question, but as been mentioned before, the, uh, the dog susceptibility genes are fairly rare. You know, the, I think um, the Springer Spaniels have a uh, BRCA mutation that accounts for high levels of breast cancer, uh, but you know, there are very few compared to those in humans that we know are uh, true cancer susceptibility genes. Okay. And every, uh, every golden retriever has been sequenced now in this study. So you know, that's a pretty phenomenal thing. 3,000 sequences ready to go to be analyzed for susceptibilities to a variety of all of the diseases and conditions that golden get. Right. Well, I think um, we're at time and these have been great questions. And I apologize to everyone who submitted questions and we, I'm trying to read through them and find commonalities and we always get way more than we can answer. But I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Page, Dr. Flory and Dr. Post for joining us, for taking the time to make those wonderful videos. And this will live on our YouTube channel, everyone. So if you want to point people toward it who maybe couldn't make it today, or if you want to review it, it will be there. Give us a couple of days and it'll, it'll be up. And again, thanks to everyone. And thanks to everyone for joining us.